Before we introduce Patrick, I, I didn't plan this, but I had to take a little, a little ironic pleasure with this tweet I got from Zero Hedge that someone shared with me about an hour ago. Barclays server crash leaves customers unable to withdraw cash or use debit cards. So thank you, Zero Hedge, for that little bit of news. Now, what do we say about Patrick Byrne, uh, a, a retail and e-commerce giant, obviously the founder of Overstock.com, but also a PhD in philosophy, and you don't often see those things, two things combined. Uh, holds degrees from Stanford, Dartmouth, and Cambridge. Uh, he, he's equally at home talking about business, about management, uh, methods with employees, about Wall Street and insider trading. He's completely comfortable and knowledgeable talking about Austrian economics and some of the Hayekian problems of knowledge. And what he's probably getting most famous for is his ideas and vision about the uses of the blockchain going forward, which are going to, God willing, uh, not only el eliminate a lot of third-party risk from all of our lives, but hopefully, most importantly, eliminate a lot of government intermediaries. So please welcome Patrick Byrne. What an honor it is to speak with, with you and, and to address the Mises Institute. I, I want to take this opportunity to say I think that in, uh, in Jeff, the Mises Institute has gotten the next generation of leadership lined up, and I think that we're going to see big things out of Mr. Brown. So. <clears throat> Great hire. Uh, honor to speak it's, it's to uh, the Mises Institute crowd again. Uh, my father always warned me that the, the eyes are the second thing to go. I don't know, after the ears, I guess. So just in case those in the back can't read this, I don't want there to be any misconceptions. This says on it, make Bitcoin great again. <laughs> I think we have to get those up on the site soon. <laughs> Uh, we have an hour and we have to 1.30. They have been very generous and gracious in, in uh, uh, asking, uh, inviting me to speak for so long. I love Q&A, uh, but they've, uh, there's going to be some philosophy first. You invite a philosopher to lunch, what you get is some philosophy, sorry to tell you that. And there's gonna, but we'll have ample time for Q&A. But as, they, as the great philosopher Pink Floyd said, <laughs> You can't have your pudding until you've eaten your meat. How can you have your pudding until you've eaten your meat? So, uh, who, so we got to go through some meat first. Uh, first, who am I? I've gotten, I've started liking this article from a profile in Wired a couple years ago, saying, "Meet Patrick Byrne, the Messiah of Bitcoin." I'm the Messiah of nothing. I hope you know that. Uh, I am the CEO of Overstock and the scourge of Wall Street. I will. Plead guilty as charged to that one. Uh, and I'm at, you may even uh, uh, deduce out of this uh, talk why that came to be. Uh, it wasn't always that way. About 12 years ago, I was the first in the country. Let me tell you a quick story. I, we went public in 2002, and I'd grown up around Wall Street. And when you're a public company CEO, as I was since 2002, you're out there in the mix quite a bit. And you're out there with hedge funds and regulators and prime brokers and bankers and venture capitalists and such. And it didn't take me very long between 02 and 04 to smell skunk and to realize there was a lot of mischief going on on Wall Street. So I just swam around in it and learned everything I can. I don't talk to, uh, my, my plan was to take it to the press. And I try to stay as far away as possible from the guys with badges and guns for reasons we all come up. But I, I got it all, uh, I gathered a whole lot of irrefutable evidence about what was going on on Wall Street. And in 05, I went public. And I, with this claim, I said that the, there's a whole bunch of mischief going on on Wall Street, centered actually on a guy named Stephen Cohen, a guy, a hedge fund, and in, in, uh, seems to have about 15 satellite funds around him. They're engaged in widespread market manipulation and insider trading. 
But most interestingly, the SEC, who the American, and I was like going on the radio saying this by name, accusing them of criminal acts, said no one's going to sue me. That's how confident I am that I'm right because they can't take discovery. And that the, most importantly, that the SEC is asleep at the switch, if not actually in bed. It's, they've actually been captured by these, these hedge funds. And there's a whole bunch of systemic risk building up and the whole thing is going to come to an ugly end. And the next day, the New York Post ran this photo of me. <laughs> They said it's crazy, it's conspiracy theory to believe that what, hedge fund, that Wall Street and the SEC are too close and that the SEC isn't protecting us? Wacky, 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 conspiracy theory. Boy, <laughs> so uh, that's who I am. Uh, I'll let you at the end decide uh, which of these, but the, the thing in common between them is whether I'm the messiah or a lunatic, is uh, I'm a fanatic. And as Churchill said, a fanatic is someone who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that I'm f fanatic about is a operating system called liberalism. Uh, and I want to be clear, uh, presumably we all know, when you talk about political, po political liberalism, we're all talking about we're not talking about Bernie Sanders. We're talking about a, a long historical tradition. So there's going to be some intellectual history here for a while. And again, I hope you forgive me, but I was asked to prepare something substantive, and be, so I have. Uh, I would like to walk through this, because I think we're up against some... I think we're like a company that has lost its brand, lost its business model, has forgotten its business model. And for the younger folks here, I think it's probably... I think that people should be... Uh, reminded what our operating system is about. And what I mean by operating system, there's a great book that the, uh, it's kind of a cult science fiction book. Who here's read Snow Crash? Okay, they have to be kind of a real hardcore anarcho-capitalist at Red Snow Crash. But it's a great book from over 20 years ago where a, a sci-fi novel that envisioned the collapse of civilization, uh, the sn a snow crash. A lot of interesting memes come out of it. The concept of cyberpunk, metaverse. He envisions in this book in 1993 things that we would now call Facebook or the World Wide Web. Uh, memes itself, the concept of memes, got traction in this book. Uh, and anarcho, this is sort of the Bible of the anarcho-capitalist. But what it, this book does is invites us to think of civilizations you know, when, as operating systems. Nobody kills each other. I think Linux is great. I think, you know, uh, Macintosh is great. I think PC, you know, it's, they're just operating systems that have different virtues and different flaws, different design uh, advantages and different design flaws. And I, the, the two main classes of operating systems, uh, and history is just as this book would invite you to see, is just a sort of a petri dish where we're looking at different operating systems and seeing what emerges as the most successful, which has the least flaws and is the most uh, useful. Uh, the two main classes of operating systems are authoritarianism and liberalism. Authoritarianism I, I love this, you know, Kennedy said this in his inaugural address, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And Milton Friedman said, well, this, like, clear, a few years later he wrote this, said that clearly, as Kennedy's subsequent act shows, he meant by country government. And uh, Milton Friedman said, neither half of the statement expresses a relationship between the citizen and his government that's worthy of the ideals of free men in a free society. Uh, and that's because, ultimately, authoritarianism, the core DNA is submission. So it's submission. And I think of George Orwell described the future this way. If you want a vision of the future, imagine a boot stepping on a human face forever. Well, I think that that's too, I hope that that's pessimistic about the future. But it certainly is a good description of history. By and large, I'm remind, I was once in 04, I was in Afghanistan searching for artisanal products for overstock, and I was talking to a young lady through an interpreter, another, a woman who was, an Afghani woman who was interpreting, pardon me, it's a little hot, and she was 
I was talking to this artist in third, and, and in translation, the woman was saying, I can't go, uh, I can't go and pick up the raw materials to make more products for you because I don't have a husband anymore. And if I walk on the road, it might be stolen, and this and that. And I corrected the translator. I said, the word isn't stolen, it's kidnapped. And this woman, this, the translator said, well, not really. In our language, we have a word for kidnapped. And if it happens, if a man is taken or something, you're kidnapped. But if a woman is taken, we use the same word that you would use for a cow or a sheep. Just like if you saw in America a cow walking down the road, you wouldn't think of it as being, you'd, you'd ask who owns it. You know, who owns the cow? The cow doesn't own the cow. Somebody owns the cow. And that is how it is for women in Afghanistan. And so we use the word that you would use if somebody steals a cow or a sheep or a woman because she's, there's no concept of a free woman. A woman is always owned by her dad or her husband or older brother or something like that. And I think that it's, that's, I think we all should remember that until the liberal revolution came along, that's largely how people had to conceive of themselves. We were ends, we were means for other people's ends. And it's easy to get confused on that when you read philosophy because people use words. Like here I pulled a line out of Machiavelli, or just, just as an example of how this can be distorted. Machiavelli speaks of whenever those states which have been acquired who live under their own laws and in freedom, there are three courses for those who wish to hold them, blah, blah, blah. What he means by a free uh, state isn't what we mean. Machiavelli means a state that is not a vassal, it's not subject to another state. But it's just taken for granted, of course, that the prince is the prince. All who live within the state are the ends or the means for the prince to achieve his ends. It's not free in that sense. So people have used these, this word freedom for a long time not to really mean anything like we conceive of it. Where does our conception come from? Well, the liberal conception, the core value for us is consent. It's all about consent. If you think of what, what we are really trying to, mo to promote at the DNA level is consent, consensual relations among humans, among citizens, and consent of the governed as a political doctrine. There are three precursors. I like to mention. I used to teach philosophy and loved, I could teach a whole semester on this. Uh, the three precursors, the first time I can even think of this having been conceptualized is in the book of Daniel. If you remember, there's a line. Da Daniel is, interprets for the king Nebuchadnezzar, and one of his interpretations is you've been judged in the balance and found wanting. Well, that ability to conceive, until then, political and divine authority were synonymous. They were united. The first evidence I can think of where somebody conceived of it differently, that there is some external balance by which you can judge political authority, is this line in the book of Daniel. A couple hundred years later, really, in uh, Athens, democracy emerges, the first voting. And also, it's interesting, I used to study Athenian democracy, and they had several different constitutions. And the constitution that turned out to work the best and created the most stable uh, uh, political system in Athens is when they went to choosing the, their representatives through sortition, which means randomly, just as we choose jurors. And believe it or not, that's it was one we don't think of anymore, although we do choose jurors that way. But when uh, it was when the de de uh, Athenian political system chose their electors at random that they, uh, that they actually fared the best. And then third, there was a Greek. He was a Greek man that lived in the Roman Republic. And, you know, Rome spent 500 years pretending they were Greek. They were sort of like East Coast Americans who look up to the French. The Romans looked up to the Greeks so much. And every good Greek house, every good Roman, you know, aristocratic household would have a Greek slave to teach the children and raise them. Uh, and there was a Greek living there in about oh, 120 BC, uh, Polybius, who wrote, and he was a tutor to one of the aristocratic households, and he wrote the histories, and he had this theory. He was the first to uh, articulate this theory of history, anacyclosis, which says it's the natural order of things that out of, the, out of primitive society, kingdom emerges, and then kingdoms degenerate 
two tyrannies. And then the tyranny gets sort of, the tyrant gets usurped by the nobility, the aristocracy around him, and they take over. And then that degenerates into uh, oligarchy. And then the people take over, that's democracy, and then that degenerates into mob rule. And it's history had, so there were benign and malign forms of each government, uh, kings to tyrants, aristocracies to oligarchies, democracy to, forget the Greek word for mob rule, but anyway, mob rule. And does someone know it? No, it's not mob because you get like an octocracy or something. So I'm great. Uh, and that the way to stop that was polycentricity, which just means decisions get decentralized. You want to have decent, if the more you centralize decision making in one body, the more it tends to accelerate this process, but the more that you can distribute political authority across different bodies, then uh, you can, we can perhaps stop this tradition of this, this historical cycle. And his great, his, he argues in one book of the histories that that's the virtue of the Roman Republic, that they had managed to balance these different interests and that this process had come to a stop. <laughs> Continuing this, uh, it really, but I'd say that's the precursor, but liberalism really starts just over 500 years ago in Spain. And we normally don't think of it this way, but it starts in Spain in two places. One place in Spain called the Lowlands or the Netherlands, which we got to remember Spain, Europe was all Spain with this island of France in it, but Europe was Spain. And in the, in the swamps on the northwest of Europe, some Germanic folk who didn't want to be under anyone's authority moved out into these swamps and realized if they could cooperate, they could drain the swamps and build la and create land and live together. So it really was a, a, but then they had to come up with the rules by which they were going to live together. And it actually is, if you, uh, was a social contract. We study, if you're studying college philosophy, political theory, you always hear about contract theory, Hobbes, Locke, John Rawls is the big one that gets studied these days, that the idea of justice is let's all agree if we were in some original position, uh, let's agree on what the rules would be and then whatever rules they would be, that's what, we, that's what we should live under now. Well, they actually did this in the Netherlands. This is what they were doing in the 1300s. And they came up with a form of government that first recognizes you know, that we, we hire somebody, if we're all working, say, to build a dam on the Amstel River, which is where it all started, hence Amstel Dam, uh, that we're going to have to cooperate and, how to, and we're going to have to have somebody who runs the show, a mayor or something, but as they think of them, just a first among equals, not some overarching presence in the sky. Government's just like a plumber or something that we've hired to get something done. And it's just a first among equals. And then enough of those enough of those uh, uh, political bodies federated, and that's that was the lowlands. So, but from the ground up, it's all consent, and it's not based on sort of this overarching respect for government as a ruler of us. It's just somebody we hired because you do need somebody to coordinate, you know, things. Uh, a merchant and bourgeoisie town emerged, and the values of the merchant class are, con are consent, consensual exchange. Uh, Erasmus, a great Catholic the theologian, uh, came and wrote the first uh, philosophical defenses of tolerance, religious tolerance, and peace, uh, but a philosophical defense of religious tolerance. Uh, Spinoza, uh, the, the great one, uh, you know, for 200 years, if you just referred to the philosopher, you meant Spinoza. He was concerned, and he came up with what we would now call the modern view of the self, maybe even the basis of psychology, our way of conceiving of ourselves as independent, as agents who have psychologies and things. That was Spinoza, and he conceived of man for the first time as an entity whose consent matters. It's not just about the princes and their dealings with each other, that the consent of the government, that we are beings worthy of consent. 
Uh, and hence, this whole sort of consensual society developed in this swampy area on the northwest of, of, uh, of Europe. And it prospered. It prospered immensely. Um, something funny happened. We give all this credit to the English as being the sort of the cradle of civilization. And if, you, if they even teach this in American high school civics anymore, you, you learn this stuff about the English. And, the, and what really happened was some English separatists, they were Brownians, they moved to, uh, they fled England and they moved to Rotterdam. And they lived there for 20 years. And they eventually uh, got fed up with the effect of the licentious and wicked ways of Amsterdam on their youth. And they decided to move. And they sailed to the New World, landed at Plymouth Rock. We know them as the Pilgrims in our history book. We give all this credit to the Pilgrims that came over. With Pilgrims are not Puritans, common misconception. Pilgrims are not Puritans. They're more like we would think of as the Quaker tradition today. And we, they didn't come from England with it. It's left what's not taught in the history books is they went and they learned it in this 20 year period in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And then also we learn in our civics classes that our founding fathers all read this great English philosopher, John Locke, the second treatise on government, where he works out a social contract. And, and this was a very influential book on our founding fathers. In truth, John Locke didn't learn it in England. He sat out the glorious revolution sitting over in Amsterdam for three years. And then he went back to England and wrote this book. This is really built, again, on his perceptions out of, out of Holland. So in, in my view, we don't give nearly the credit to the Netherlands that we should intellectually. It's really where liberalism was conceived. It, it maybe was cradled in, in England and Britain and then came to the US. But uh, And then there's another part of Spain. And there's a wonderful economist. Uh, who I don't know if he has spoken at Mises, but Jesus Huerta de Soto, is he known in the, has he spoken? Uh, and he has developed, well, it was really Murray Roth Rothbard, I understand, who first made this argument and that Hayek approved it. Uh, and it was an argument that what we, uh, that f oh, just over 400 years ago, the University of Salamanca in Spain, something very special happened, a bunch of Jesuits uh, and Dominicans, created this scholastic school. It really sort of took the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas and natural rights philosophy and developed it. And they, they noticed both from their own philosophizing and also from the, the Spain was at the time, it was the golden age of Spain and there, and there had big influx of gold and silver from the new world. And so they were thinking economically and they came up with the first subjectivist theory of value, the idea that the value of something is not some function of how much labor has been put in it. Or, I mean, people used to have these philosophical discussions, like how do we determine what the value of something is? And it was them who said the value is the appraisal of the person who will buy it. There's no sort of way to find some intrinsic value in something. Uh, the impossibility of socialist calculation. The idea that prices can't be set by any authority because it's just you'd have to know all the preferences of too many people and how they really value things. And even God himself and in his infinite wisdom could not perform the calculations to describe what the price of everything must be. Uh, they saw the big inflation as this gold came back from the new world. There was a big bout of inflation in Spain, the quantity theory of money. They even discovered what we now would call the equivalence of demand deposits and certificates of deposits. That if a banking system, a banking system can create inflation by over, uh, uh, by over issuing uh, either. So it isn't just, uh, that the book basically through fractional reserve banking, you can create inflation as well. All of this and also the, the value and the sort of fundamental importance of entrepreneurship, property, contract, how this is what really moves society forward. These are, oh, peace, there was just as there was in Spain, uh, there was a, a actual peace movement, probably the world's first peace movement. You had scholastics writing against the crown about the virtue, you know, what we would now call a peace movement, about how wrong it was to be going and doing these things in the new world. Uh, these thoughts moved to the eastern edge of the Spanish Empire, which was then, well, the eastern edge was the Österreich, the eastern reign, the Österreich, which is Austria. 
And there they hibernated for 250 years. They hibernated in universities there until they came out and come down to us uh, starting about 150 years ago as the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, that's actually uh, what we know as the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, Jesus Huerto de Soto and, and through him I understand Murray Rothbard have confirmed that actually started back 400 years ago in S Salamanca. And I view, if you mix all these memes up of consent, uh, consent, federation among consensual states, consensual exchange, tolerance, religious tolerance, pluralism, uh, uh, and on the right, these, these economic concepts, I think you get pretty much the U.S. Constitution. In fact, this isn't, uh, Jefferson read, there was a book by one of the scholastics called The History of Spain, Marianas, and Jefferson got copies and sent it to all the founding fathers. They all read this book because he thought in the history of Spain, which is uh, one, which is the material from which the the the, his, the Salamanca school work, that one could f find proof of these of the uh, of the benefit of these concepts, and that in a, in an obvious way, our U.S. Constitution embodies this tradition. Uh, it's under attack. So that's the, that's the quick, short course on, I think, where liberalism, where our operating system comes from. What's important to know is it is under attack in four ways. Uh, philosophically, constitutionally, from a point of view of institutional design, and a civilizational attack. Uh, philosophically, I... I'm only going to hit one of these, really, at any length. Rousseau. Rousseau is the great enemy of mankind. Rousseau, see, when the, the tyrants, when the authoritarians couldn't fight it anymore, they, they subverted it in different ways. And for Rousseau, he writes this book, The Social Contract, where he says, where he says yes, the, the consent of people, the will of other people is important, but it's not this silly will. You don't find out what the will of a people is just by voting. That's not, that's a silly, you know, we're French. We're, that's superficial. Uh, it's that the will, uh, each of us puts his person and all his power in common under the supreme direction of the general will. La volonté générale. There's a general will that we have, we don't discover it by voting amongst ourselves, but there, there's a general will that, that is our purpose. The sovereign power need no guarantee, give no guarantee to its subjects. Thus the dominant will of the prince is or should be nothing but the general will or the law. And whoever refuses to obey the general will shall be compelled to do so by the whole body. This means nothing less than that he will be forced to be free. This is the great... <laughs> Well, we laugh, but I'm going to show you momentarily where this shows up in our modern discourse. You know, it, uh, yeah, this is the great philosophical jujitsu move against liberalism. Uh, that, yes, okay, you folks are right, not authority. It is the will that's important, but the real will isn't what you silly people think your will is. It's what some Robespierre is going to come and make clear to you what your will is. And if you don't, what your collective will is. And if you don't go along with it, he can just force you to be free. And that's what real freedom is. So the real jujitsu move to always be alert for is somebody telling you that freedom isn't this, or liberty isn't this silly thing of you pursuing what you want, but is subordination, submission to some other process to some other mechanism. That describes basically the next 200 years of, oh, by the way, Voltaire read this and wrote to R Rousseau, dear M Monsieur Rousseau, I've received, sir, your, n your new book against the human race. <laughs> and thank you for it. One longs in reading your book to walk on all fours. <laughs> And that was Voltaire. I love, somebody once asked B uh, Bertrand Russell if he had a Bible. He said, yeah, yeah, I keep it over there under my Voltaire. <laughs> uh, um, this mistake has propagated through philosophy for 200 years. I'm not going to walk through in great detail, but, uh, but basically this, the common denominator of this mistake is somebody saying freedom isn't what you think 
what this American conception of freedom is. It's a, or what our conception of freedom is. It's a, it's sub submission to something else. And Kant was really, although we think of him as the father of liberalism, some people do, he really didn't get it, didn't get the joke, and he still, at the end of the day, thought freedom was submission to a historical process. Hegel, basically, in my view, just warmed over Kant. Marx, uh, same thing. Submission, if you've ever had the, uh, I don't know, uh, misfortune to argue with a, uh, with a hardcore lefty. I used to live in China in the early 80s, and I would have these long debates with my, I was a foreign student, I would have these debates with my, I was, my, my, Chai Com friends, my roommates and stuff, and they would say, well, what you are, what you understand as freedom is just this bourgeois Western understanding. And we have, you know, through the science of Marxism and such, some Marxist, Ma Lenin, Maoist thought, we understand that real freedom is submission to this process. And by furthering this process, that's how a man, that's how a person really achieves true freedom. Uh, Nietzsche, did the same, different, different process named, but he actually referred to, what did he say? If John Stuart Mill, only an Englishman cares about happiness. In other words, this idea of life, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that the English, that's just like, a, that's like this trivial, superficial conception of freedom. I'm going to bring down from the mountains a, a much richer conception is through subordination to that, submission to that, that real freedom exists. Uh, Lenin kind of twisted, well, it's not submission to this historical process, it's submission to, you know, the, the, uh, the vanguard, the vanguard of the process, the party itself. And literally, if you go back a hundred or less than a hundred years and look at how this stuff was debated, there are, uh, there's absolutely people ma made this argument that it's through submission, in this case, to the party. Like, if you've ever, uh, that is through submission to the party that real freedom is found. So it's the same twist over and over. Freedom isn't this sort of silly, superficial thing of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It's submitting yourself to something else is where you really achieve freedom. Uh, Hitler, Arbeit Max Frei, Arbeit Max Frei over the gates of the concentration camps. Work makes you free. Submission to the, to the state and such. Uh, Mao Pol Pot. It's, again, when I've been in these parts, even Cambodia, I've been in and, uh, a long time ago. People all know the Rousseau. People, the, the Chinese students maybe couldn't study any Western philosopher other than Rousseau uh, and Marx, and Marx, uh, Marx Lenin. It's the authoritarian um, instinct needs, needs to make this flip. It's the same Judah move over and over, that, the, that freedom is submission to something else. Um, Voltaire said, people who believe in absurdities will eventually commit atrocities. And that mistake is, a, that is, an, is an absurdity. Um, uh, recently, we had a politician say, the more I looked at what our founders were talking about, they understood happiness to mean true happiness, not pleasure and enjoyment as we see happiness today, but doing what you ought to do, doing what you're oriented to do doing what God oriented you to do. In other words, doing the right thing. What our founders were talking about was the liberty to be able to pursue what you ought to do. And he's very ready to tell you what you ought to do. This was Rick Sandorum. <laughs> so this isn't just idle. This philosophical error, error has crept into the, not crept in, it has barged into the discourse and polluted it for 200 years. Uh, and it still lives. Uh, that's philosophically, constitutionally, uh, it's always been under attack. It held its own, uh, and I think that it would have held its own. It was a, a well-designed system that our Constitution would have held its own until somebody had to cheat. And the great scholar who has deconstructed this so beautifully is Richard Epstein. Uh, he wrote a book called How Progressive Re Progressives Rewrote the Constitution, and he traces how in uh, jurisprudence, American jurisprudence, the principles of our Constitution got subverted. And sort of, to me, I was just hearing people talk about the regulatory state, the administrative state. None of that was really possible in the Constitution as it was written. The idea was to have... 13 laboratories or 50 laboratories trying lots of different things. Polycentricity. Remember? Lots of different 
laboratories trying to solve problems and then the better solutions would get recognized and emulated and that's how policy innovation would work. That was a beautiful aspect of the Constitution, uh, not sufficiently appreciated, it seems to me, judging from the discourse. Well, that got ruined by the administrative state. The particular case was Wickard versus Filburn. You know, Roosevelt came in and he passed all these laws that the Supreme Court struck down, said these are unconstitutional. We basically tried to Mussolini our uh, country. And, uh, uh, which is an interesting story to go into uh, uh, on the side, but people forget Mussolini was very widely respected and regarded in the United States until 1935 when he invaded Libya. But Mussolini, anyway, oh, Tom, is Tom, there you are. Did you write about this, the effect of, of mu the connection between Mussolini and Roosevelt? Have, is that? Okay, <laughs> you have everything else, why not this? Uh, anyway, they, and it really comes down to as absurd a case as this, a farmer, I think it was in Iowa, uh, well, eventually Roosevelt got sick of this and in 1936 told the Supreme Court, I told the country I'm gonna pack the Supreme Court. Nothing says I can't take it from nine judges to 15. There's nothing in the Constitution that specifies the number of judges, originally it was five, and I'm gonna put six of my own guys on. And, at that point, the spring term in 1937, the Supreme Court buckled. And it was called the switch in time that saved nine. And they buckled and they started rubber stamping uh, as constitutional, the flagrantly unconstitutional, unconstitutional things FDR was doing. And in 1942 or 43, a case came to the Supreme Court where Roosevelt had, had a uh, program that was setting price, prices for agricultural goods nationally and a farmer had grown wheat in his own backyard and made something with it, got uh, in trouble with the feds, goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and on the grounds of the Commerce Clause, uh, that the federal government could reach in because the federal government had an interest in maintaining price stability in farm products and this and that, and if a farmer grows his own wheat and eats it, then that's wheat he didn't buy in the national market, so he's having an effect, however infinitesimal, on the national market. Hence, this is a fit subject for federal intervention. Well, that's so philosophically tenuous. That's what I mean by saying the system really ultimately did take a crime to be broken. It took the threat to pack the court, and it took decisions like that to for, uh, for the Constitution to stop working. And what that decision was the opening of the administrative state. Once they did that, then it becomes a fit uh, subject for federal administrators and regulators to regulate just about anything. Another great example of that actually, marijuana, uh, marijuana in California, when it was first legalized here, there was a woman, like a leukemia patient, who was dying and grew a plant in her backyard. And that was the test case they brought. It was Gonzalez v. Reich. And went to the Supreme Court, where we discussed, where there's only one person on the Supreme Court, in my mind, who actually understands the Constitution. It's Clarence Thomas. And because lots of conservative judges are way too deferential to Congress and way too deferential to government authority, if you want to read a real libertarian uh, treasure, read Clarence Thomas's dissent in the Gonzales v. Reich, where he said if the federal government can regulate that, a woman growing a pot plant in her backyard, they can regulate spelling bees and anything else in the country. Um, <clears throat> the third of the four ways it's under attack is institutional design. And here is... Uh, here's the real insertion point in our operating system for the virus that we are up against is the insertion point for the virus of authoritarianism is centralized institutions. Because centralized institutions, I won't read all of this, but Federalist 10, I just heard Federalist 47 referred to. Federalist 10 says, uh, it, was, it was Madison wrote it, uh, uh, basically, we studied all the ways that other constitu uh, that all their attempts at democracy had failed, uh, how they failed, and we designed this constitution to be uh, better than that. But uh, the thing that we haven't, I'm abridging, and the thing that we haven't solved, he's basically saying, is this problem of faction, 
Uh, none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break the balance of faction. The friend of popular governments never finds himself so much alarmed for their character as when he, and fates as when he contemplates their propensity to this dangerous vice. Uh, this is what factions, is what uh, are the mortal diseases under which popular governments have everywhere perished. And uh, by factions, he meant what we would call special interests. Special interests, the ability for people to organize and get special treatment. And he says this very interesting thing, the valuable improvements made by the American constitutions, meaning this constitution, and the popular models, both ancient and modern, cannot certainly be too much admired, but it would be an unwarrantable partiality to contend that they have as effectively obviated the danger on this side as was wished and imagined. In other words, we have designed this constitution to prevent all these flaws that we've seen take down previous attempts at democracy, but there's one thing that we wish we had solved better uh, was this problem of special interests, and that's the one that brings down uh, democracies in the long run. So this is the weakness in our operating system. It comes with wanting a rule, a nation of laws and not men. You have to rely on centralized institutions. And centralized institutions have this tendency to become uh, corrupted. They have this tendency to get captured, regulatory capture. We call it when it happens to regulators. Uh, they're actually Marxists who argue it happens much deeper than just with the regulators. It happens through the whole state, through academia. Uh, and I actually have a website called Deep Capture, which is about this process regarding our financial markets. So the real problem with, uh, if liberalism is uh, an operating system of institutions or of laws and not men, or institutions and not people, then when those institutions get captured, that's, that's our great weakness. And if they, if they have a tendency to be captured, they create, this creates what John Kenneth Galbraith called the bezel in financial circles. John Kenneth, uh, no, yeah, Galbraith said that, that at any given time, there's what the people are being told is in the financial system and what's there. If you could just freeze time and add up what every single one of you is being told is there, your ownership, and can compare it what's there, there's a huge discrepancy. And that discrepancy is the amount that has been embezzled from society over time. That's the bezel. And I would argue that our centralized institutions that govern our financial arrangements display this uh, to no end. So we want to get rid of, where possible, centralized institutions because they are this liability, they are this weak point uh, in our operating system. And where possible, we don't want to be uh, overseen by centralized institutions because they do get captured. The blockchain has come along. And what the blockchain is so great at, the economist calls it the trust machine. We can now, through blockchain, engage in all kinds of consensual exchange and, and all kinds of activities without them being mediated by central institutions. Uh, we will see shortly central banking is one of them. I have been focusing my attention on an area of Wall Street called central counterparty clearing. I won't go into the details, but what effectively what the blockchain does to Wall Street is as follows. It uh, drags it behind the barn and it kills it with an ax. <laughs> And why that's, that's going to do that to Wall Street quickly, but it also, it can do it to all kinds of centralized institutions. Think of property, think of a land titling. You can't trust, you know, the common denominator of so many central institutions is we can't trust each other, so we agree. I'll stop this from uh, <laughs> slashing a <the> bull. <laughs> we can't, oh, well, what the heck. Uh, <laughs> You know, if I'm going to trade you a camel for your gold coin, I don't know whether to trust you. Did you debase the coin or not? So there's a business model that is someone prints, you know, they're a mint. And they, someone who has the monopoly on violence in an area creates a mint, puts his face on everything that gets minted. Anyone who debases that gets, it gets killed. It's a way to monetize one's monopoly on violence. It's a business model. We happen to call it government, but it's a business model. There's lots of business models that, both public and private, that share this feature. 
It's we can't trust each other, so we just agree there's some third party institution we trust. Land titling could be one, notary publics is another. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of these things that now we can achieve that trust. For the first time in 6,000 years of human history, we can have that trust come about not through some central institution that we all agree on, but, on, but through blockchain. Now, how that happens is a, is a big subject, and I won't go any farther into it. And lastly, and I, I read in the, uh, in the material that you pride yourselves on not being PC, so I'm going to bring up an uncomfortable subject, at least in much discourse, and that is uh, if our DNA, at, at the, if our genetic material is about consent, what do we do if an authoritarian operating system emerges disguised as a religion? Its core value is submission, but it's, uh, as a religion, we grant it uh, you know, the, the, from the very beginning, we've been about religious tolerance. So uh, now, of course, I'm talking about Islam. Now, Islam has, lot, I've spent a lot of my life in the Middle East, so I'm not just speaking from you know, Fox News. Uh, Islam has variants, and before, say, 1979, I think it was, uh, it, it did not have the tendency I'm describing. But at the core, for some Salafist and and extremist interpretations of Islam, the, the, the basic worldview is there's the world that has submitted to the will of Allah, the world that has submitted, the world, the Dar al-Islam, and Islam means submission, the Dar al-Islam, and we in the world have submitted, uh, who have submitted versus the world that we're still at war with. So there's the world of submission and the world of war, Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb. Uh, and what do you do? If an operating system comes along, its fundamental value, by some interpretations, is submission. And that shows up in a, where, uh, in a society whose fundamental value is consent. I'm not sure that a carbon-based life form can ever mate successfully with a silicon-based life form. I'm not sure there's ever going to be a way to uh, work this out. Now, fortunately, we're assured it's a small fraction of, the, of Muslims who believe this way, and I'm happy to hear that. I read a poll last year on, uh, among uh, the immigrants to Europe. 13% uh, of them, 10% of them support ISIS somewhat, and 13% support ISIS strongly. So that's 23% will tell a pollster they support ISIS. I don't know what the real number is. My guess is higher than 23%. So there is some, uh, you know, so there is some non-negligible fraction uh, that don't have anything like the fuzzy, bunny, soft interpretation of Islam that we are told is the standard interpretation of Islam. And like I've said, I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East with a lot of people who believe in another interpretation of Islam, which is the one I'm describing. The fundamental value is submission. And we may be kidding ourselves that you can ever, that there's ever a way to integrate that into a liberal society. Maybe not. Maybe we have to do a better job of integrating, but maybe it's something that uh, has to be fought in a different way. My preferred route is I think the U.S. should be all about women in the Muslim world. We should focus all of our attention on the situation of women in the Muslim world, both because it is consistent with our values and because it would be, it is quite subversive for their societies. And that's how we, I believe, we should be addressing that problem. So anyway, that is liberalism. That is uh, the four ways it's under attack.